So today I want to uh, I want to sh show you a little bit of, of what we're doing in the group in, in one of the major projects, which is also one of the reasons why I'm here. And also it's going to be a look uh, forward looking pr uh, presentation, especially at the end, uh, which will have a fair amount of, of unpublished data. Some of them are actually uh, week old, the weeks old at most and uh, do provide essentially the, the footprint um, uh, of, of the, the next steps that will be going on in my group. And some of them will be related um, to the research I, I want to carry on uh, here. So to give you a bit of a broad in, uh, overview of my research interest, uh, so we are uh, in the chemistry department, and but we are uh, also very much uh, systems engineering oriented. So we, we do design instrumentation, and this is one of the instruments that we designed uh, actually that led to the startup that Emily mentioned. I'm not going to show any details um, of that today, but we use a surface plasma resonance to do protein analysis. And at the moment, the, the big thing for us is, is COVID analysis. We do a lot of, of antibody measurements uh, for COVID uh, in positive in individuals in Canada. Uh, we oftentimes uh, do synthesized materials as well. So we do uh, plasmonic nanomaterials. Uh, we functionize with surface chemistry. So we do play a lot with surface chemistry. Uh, of course, we, we do spectroscopy and we do a lot of, of field applications. So we always try to, in, to uh, embed in the research projects a, uh, a forward-looking field application. So here you have two examples and I don't have time to discuss today, but uh, that um, have been uh, large projects in the group in the past 10 years. So this one here is a, a field deployable explosive sensor. So this is uh, one of the field trip we've done uh, in the province of Quebec. Actually, it was mid-April, so it looks like it's winter, but it's actually springtime in Quebec City. So um, you can see that the winter stays for some time in Canada. And um, so we were able to detect uh, explosives in underground water close to military bases, trying to see if we could come up with an environmental sensor to detect potential contamination. Uh, on the left side here, we have uh, some maple syrup interest. Of course, this is very stereotypical, but uh, we do have one of the largest maple syrup producers uh, uh, in the province of Quebec. Uh, this is uh, actually on campus where we tapped maple trees a couple of years ago, uh, and we uh, were able to collect uh, some maple sap uh, samples. And this is part of my uh, research lab, which you can see that there are uh, thousands of maple syrup samples. Actually, the, this only uh, represents a fraction of, of the maple syrup samples we have, and we uh, receive uh, over the years about 40,000 uh, maple syrup samples to analyze. But today, uh, the, the topic I want to discuss more is essentially monitoring cell secretion events. So if you're trying to measure molecules inside cells, it, there's a number of exquisite tools like fluorescent spectroscopy. So you can get exquisite images of, of molecules inside cells with sub-diffraction um, limit resolution, now with super-resolution uh, microscopy. But the problem is when the molecule leaves the cell, it, it goes into the bulk, and there's very, very few analytical techniques that allows you to monitor the molecules that are being secreted. Um, of course, there are some methods, uh, for example, uh, electrochemistry using ultra micro electrodes, so electrodes that are on the order of 100 nanometers in diameter, uh, but they will only detect electroactive molecules. Uh, you can also do micro sampling, for example, using uh, just uh, small tips to uh, collect. Uh, picoliters to femtoliters of solution close to the cells. Uh, and then you proceed with, with traditional analytical techniques such as, as uh, uh, chromatography or mass spectrometry. But that provides a very poor time resolution because you have to sample each time and, and go to the lab to analyze those uh, offline most of the time. So we're trying to build on the technique that, uh, of patch clamping. So patch clamp is, uh, I would say, an old school electrophysiology technique where you put a very thin uh, glass capillary close or in contact with the cells. And that uh, allows you to, mo to monitor changes in potential. So the change in potential will be seen as spikes when you activate the cells, for example, here is basal level. And uh, by activating the, the, uh, uh, the cells with a chemical stimuli, well, you see more spikes. The cells become more active. And then you see a change in the rate of spikes per second, for example, by activating the cells. But that doesn't provide a chemical information. It provides just a, a, a broad physical information about the cell. So now we're trying to, to come up with a, a technique that could essentially work in a very similar way as um, patch clamping, but now to provide a molecular information in proximity of cells. 
So we base this on the optical techniques of plasmonics. Uh, I don't think I need to go in very much details about plasmonics, but just in the, for the sake of making sure that everyone uh, understands the, uh, the plasmonic uh, phenomenon for the rest of the talk. Um, the, the plasmonics works on metallic nanosubstrates. Uh, in our case, it's oftentimes gold nanoparticles that are a sub wavelength of the light. So when the light comes in, the electric field of light will either um, attract or repel electrons, uh, free electrons in the, uh, in the particle. And due to the oscillating nature of the light, well, these electrons will begin to, uh, to become uh, in resonance uh, with the light beam. So they will oscillate at the same frequency as the light beam and thus creating an absorption band in a UV vis spectra. So that uh, can be uh, used for building chemical sensors. And we have done a lot of refractometry based sensors where the, um, here the position of the maximum will change depending on the molecules binding on the surface of, of the particles. So then if you have proper surface chemistry, then you can detect specific molecules doing so. One of the interesting aspects uh, of that uh, field oscillation is that it creates a, some sort of an antenna effect where, uh, for example, in the case here of, of spheres, you get the, the dipole um, on the spheres uh, when he radiated at the proper wavelength. And that dipole would create a very high field uh, at the proximity of the, of the particles within the first couple nanometers uh, near the particle. And if a molecule is, is bound or in that uh, field, uh, the, the enhanced field, well, that molecule will experience a much higher Raman scattering cross-section such that you can detect now surface enhanced Raman scattering from even single molecules binding to these uh, surfaces. And the fact that we can detect single molecules becomes critical uh, for, the next, uh, uh, for the next part of the, uh, of the presentation because you can identify which molecules bind to a particle by looking at the Raman signatures or the fingerprint of the molecule. So by working at a, at a single molecule regime, each spectra is uh, unique for a single molecule. And thus you can associate that spectra to a specific molecule being uh, present at a, at a given time. So now, how can we do surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy on a patch clamp type of glass substrate? So we pull glass capillaries to the same specification as for patch clamping. So the tip here would be on the order of less than a micron. And then we decorate that tip with gold nanoparticles. So when molecules like metabolites are released by cells, they can diffuse to the tip. And if they bind on the tip, we'll see a distinctive Raman spectra from that molecule. So at time t, we could associate that Raman spectra, for example, with dopamine. Um, the using piezoelectric stages and also uh, just focusing a uh, proper focusing of the of the pipette tip and cells, we can place these tips within tens or actually within microns uh, and less than ten microns from cells. And also uh, we can pierce cells and measure inside cells because these tips are so small that they will just uh, puncture the, the cell membrane and not cause significant damage uh, in the same way as, as patch clamp has been doing uh, for the past uh, decades. So now how do we prepare uh, those tips? Well, there's two different methods that we have used in the past. Initially, we, we have used a random orientation of uh, gold nanoparticles on the glass capillary. So the first thing is that we um, uh, render the glass hydrophilic uh, by exposing it to some acid. And then we uh, bind on the surface of the glass a uh, chemical, which is an amino silane. So the amino group at acidic pH will be positively charged such that negatively charged nanoparticles uh, at the same pH will essentially cluster a clump on the tip and form a layer of particles, as you can see here. And those particles will bind all the way down to the tip. So we do see that there are a, a high number of particles on the tip. One of the drawbacks of that is that since we have a random orientation, uh, the tip-to-tip -tip reproducibility is actually quite poor. So we spent essentially a PhD um, uh, lifetime uh, to try to optimize a, 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 a different methods to bind particles on the surface. So the way we came up is that we use a block copolymer uh, surface chemistry. So block copolymers are two strands of polymers that are different in chemical composition that are linked together. So they can't uh, phase separate properly. So if you put them uh, in solution, they will tend to form micelles. Uh, however, if there, if there is a surface, you can form a brush layer, uh, so essentially a monolayer of the polymer on the surface. So in the case of glass, glass will absorb polyfluoropyridine pyridine fairly well because polyfluoropyridine pyridine is, is slightly hydrophilic due to the pyridine group here, but polystyrene is actually hydrophobic. 
such that it does not like to stick to glass and it will form a strand of polymer that actually sticks out uh, in the solution. Gold nanoparticles do like uh, polyfluor vinyl pyridine due to the pyridine uh, gold interaction, such that it will bind on the surface. But since there is polystyrene as well, uh, polystyrene uh, will not interact with the gold particles. So it will essentially encapsulate the outer of, uh, base of the, of the gold particle and prevent uh, particle to particle interactions. So we can deposit dense, uh, but well dispersed areas of gold nanoparticles on the tips. And, uh, the, and it actually does work uh, all the way down to the tip uh, of the, these nanofibers. Uh, this is actually one of the only methods that work to pattern particles on, on the surface of a fiber because uh, normal nanofabrication techniques, such as, for, for example, lithography uh, technique uh, or um, etching techniques, uh, do not work on such a high uh, radius of curvature because the, uh, the, the radius of curvature will actually com uh, completely change the physics of film formation on, 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 the, on the surface, and such that surface tension and, and capillary and drag forces become dominant and you don't form a film, but you form droplets. So, but, but by using the brush copolymer template method, we, we, have, we achieve templating of the gold particles on the tip uh, of the nanofibers. We can deposit uh, particles of different uh, size. So you see here from 15 nanometers to 78 nanometers. Uh, that's about the upper limit. So particles larger than 78 nanometers do not tend to form uh, dense films uh, on the surface. And we can also uh, perform the position of, of uh, asymmetric gold nanoparticles, in this case, nanostars or nano raspberries. So as long as they have a citrate cap, uh, we can bind them. And you can see them uh, on the surface, they are fairly well dispersed. So the asymmetric particles do tend to um, uh, aggregate a little bit more than the spheres. But you, we do get um, dense arrays uh, of these particles on the tips. Let's now look a little bit more about the, the, the photonic properties of these tips. So one of the first uh, surprising results we got is that by depositing the identical arrays of particles on the flat and on the, on the nanofiber, uh, we saw that the, uh, uh, the Raman signal was about an order of magnitude greater on the uh, fiber than on the flat surface. So um, that was true for a chemical layer. So in this case, it's for, uh, forming heptobenzoic acid. Uh, but it was also true for uh, an untargeted sensing of, for example, dopamine. So we see that the templated method does have um, a much higher signal, even compared to the aggregated gold nanoparticles. So the APTIS method here um, will lead to aggregation, and it's, it's believed, and actually it was proven, uh, that if you have aggregation of, of the nanoparticles on a, on a surface substrate, you will get much higher Raman signal. But in our case, we see that the templated method does lead to a much, much higher signal, even though there's very, very few aggregated particles on the surface. So we, we are investigating this a little bit more. So one of the first uh, hypotheses that we've um, uh, uh, we've stipulated is that we, we thought there would be a lens effect. So essentially, the the the, um, the light comes in uh, tang uh, well perpendicular to um, uh, to the capillary, tangential to the the radius or the the, the circumference of the um, uh, of the uh, capillary, such that there would be a lensing effect. So essentially, the rays could bend uh, as it would, it would on a normal lens. I see that this one, it would be on the order of a couple of microns. And thus focus the light on few particles on the other opposite side of the, um, uh, of the incoming light. And we do see that uh, FDTD submissions tend to support that. We also thought that if, if there can be a lens effect, there could be a ring resonator effect. So a ring resonator is a photonic device where the, the light race tracks around uh, this uh, ring. And if there's an integer number of wavelengths propagating inside uh, that length of the ring, there will be a constructive um, uh, optical effect where the light will build up uh, in the ring and such that it will accumulate uh, in that ring and thus will lead to a much, much higher electric field. Well, you can see that the, uh, we can use the outer or the circumference of the, um, of the fiber as a ring resonator. And this has been done on, for example, glass spheres in, in the past. So one of the uh, first manifestations of that uh, is we saw that at different diameters, we saw much different enhancement of the Raman signal. So here's a peak area at a uh, different um, uh, the diameter of the fiber. So we just essentially focus the light on different part of the fiber because the fiber being conical, we do have access to different diameters. And we see that uh, at the uh, smaller diameter here of 0.6 micron, we saw a much higher 
uh, field enhancement, uh, so a much higher Raman response than at other diameters. So that was the first indication that there could be a ring resonator effect or a lensing effect as well. So now um, I'll show you some very, very recent data that we've collected, where in this case, we have done images of the tips. So we've, we've modeled the tip as being a pseudo hexagonal uh, arrangement of gold metal particles at the tip. And you see here uh, the, um, uh, the actual SEM images of some of the tips. And we've raster scanned uh, the, the Raman beam uh, on the surface. And thus we can create an image of the Raman intensity. In this case, we were using a uh, four natural uh, uh, thiophenol. And, uh, and in the regions where the, which has the most Raman signal will be colored in red and the ones of, of, of weak Raman signal will be colored in blue. So here we have an image of the tip. Uh, this is a Raman image of the tip. And you see here that at the tip, there's very little signal. There's some essentially a ring effect that are coming up here. But when we get to a larger diameter, we see that there are bands of really high Raman signal that are at spaced at different uh, diameters. So it appears that uh, this ring resonator effect could be actually holding uh, ground. So then we want to uh, perform uh, more calculations. So um, we have performed the FDTB calculations on these um, uh, two, two different diameters. So you see here on the smaller diameter, we do have a more normal response of dipolar response, but here the larger diameter, we see some sort of a land effect. So the field concentrates at the outside here, and then it back propagates uh, into the fiber and thus could build up under continuous illumination, could build up field. And that's what we see here uh, on, the, um, uh, on the, the image uh, that is labeled E. So we see that at, at the status uh, or that the um, uh, equilibrium effect, we do see a high field on both sides and periodically actually on the uh, circumference of the, um, of the fiber here. So it does appear that uh, we do have a lensing effect and uh, a, um, a ring resonator effect that does enhance significantly the Raman response uh, on, these, um, on these nanofibers. So now we have the nanofibers, uh, they are plasmonically active. So we can turn on the laser and monitor dynamically the Raman response. And we do see that this response is characteristic of single molecule detection, as we have peaks that appear and disappear depending on the spectra. And such that uh, this, uh, for example, here in this case was dopamine at uh, low concentration. And we do see that the, the spectra appears and disappear and also changes uh, in the shape and form of the spectra because uh, in single molecule detection regime, uh, the orientation of the molecule on the fiber uh, on the, or on the particle will dictate essentially um, which vibrational bands will be enhanced and others that will not be enhanced. So um, we can acquire these spectra within tens of milliseconds. So providing a dynamic uh, mean of, of monitoring molecules close to cells uh, or neurons. So we can calibrate uh, the sensor for different type of molecules. So in this case here, we just have a subset of metabolites. So we have pyruvate, lactate, urea, and ATP. And we can essentially so sort of barcode uh, each of these molecules. And you can see that, for example, the pyruvate and lactate only differ by the oxidation state here of the carbon uh, oxygen bound. Uh, otherwise, a molecule is identical. Uh, and they do have the very different Raman spectra. So we can distinguish uh, very closely related molecules by the Raman spectra. And we can use that fingerprint method uh, to be able to, um, uh, to identify them uh, when they bind to the, the surface of our uh, surface nanotip. Of course, as I mentioned, the, depending on the orientation of the molecule on the surface, it will change the Raman spectra. So um, we have been implementing machine learning to be able to extract um, uh, the uh, proper assignment of each of the spectra to, um, to its molecule of origin. Um, it, essentially, um, one can see uh, the SIRS um, or single molecule SIRS as being uh, analogous to taking pictures of, an, of someone. So we can take pictures of someone from different profiles and depending on the profile that we take in picture, it will be the same person, but not, the picture will not be identical uh, to the one, uh, to another one, for example, of the same person. But um, when you take all of those together, they, they, they are essentially reconstituting the same individual. The same thing happens with Raman spectroscopy. So we can use um, uh, machine learning to uh, feed in single molecule, uh, for example, ATP uh, Raman spectra. We train the neural network to recognize the features of ATP and to properly assign the label to ATP uh, when we feed in new data, which are unlabeled 
and thus uh, will recognize the features of ATP and thus pro assign the proper label. So it does work essentially the, the, the same way as, as any other machine learning algorithm. And we do have a convolutional neural network uh, model that is based uh, on TensorFlow, which is the open source um, uh, algorithm from Google. This way we can um, train uh, for different type of molecules. Uh, we can also validate that it performs well. So usually we, we, we train uh, with a high number of spectra. So in this case, we train, we, we train with thousands of spectra. And we can see that we properly assign in this uh, confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix, um, the diagonal here is the, are the proper assignments. So if, we, if we're trying to detect, uh, if we have peer rate in the solution, how much uh, of that uh, spectrum will be properly assigned to peer rate is about 90%. And there's a little bit of, of cross reactivity with other molecules, but it's always below a few percent. So if you look at the diagonal here, we can assign properly about 90% um, of the spectrum correctly. We do have to calibrate for the background as well, because the, for example, the culture medium uh, for cells will have um, other molecules. So we need to properly assign that to the background. Otherwise, TensorFlow will, will try to force assign a, spec the, a spectra to one of the molecules it knows. So now we have built a, a Raman microscope made for optophysiology. So the way we've done this is that we've hijacked the AFM Raman microscope where we've uh, used the piezoelectric stage or the piezo stage here uh, to, um, uh, that is used to scan uh, and to position the, the AFM tip as a holder for our uh, service nano tip. We place it at the focal point uh, of the laser beam that is coming here uh, uh, using that beam splitter or that decorate mirror depending on which system we use. And thus, the Raman scattering will be uh, scattered in all directions, including the one back scattered to the Raman spectrometer. And we also added a fluorescence excitation channel where we can see fluorescence from the cells and thus be able to position the, uh, the sensor quite accurately near cells uh, or neuron. And then we added a fluorescence imaging camera to be able to uh, monitor that fluorescence uh, as well. So here we have a fluorescence image of, of neurons. Uh, under the microscope. So we, uh, we will always uh, zero the, the, the um, Z stage of the microscope uh, on, the, um, uh, on the cells. And then we will uh, actually raise the microscope to place the sensor in place. And then the sensor here is drawn because the sensor is non-fluorescent, but we do see on the actual image, a shadow of the sensor. And then we can place a sensor in focus um, uh, at the same focal point and then lower back the microscope stage with accurate positioning within microns uh, from cells to neuron. So we can use that to guide where the sensor will be. So in the case of neurons, we want to be very close to axons where actually dopamine, for example, is, 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 is uh, released uh, under simulation. Um, we also have to be careful with the laser power you're doing SIRS. Uh, so if we have, for example, one milliwatt of laser power at 633 nanometers, we can kill the neuron. So here we have the image of neurons before excitation. Then we have the, the uh, neurons after the measurement uh, under one milliwatt of laser power. And we see those blobs are indicative of um, thermal damage uh, to the neurons. If we drop the power to a half a milliwatt, we see that the, the before and after images are actually identical as uh, showing that we do not have um, uh, an effect on the neurons, at least a, a physiological effect on the neurons by irradiating with the laser. Um, this brings up actually uh, a conundrum. So it can either be good or bad to generate that heat. So uh, if you want to sense the neurons, it's actually quite bad because you're killing the neurons uh, and you're going to measure the depth of neurons instead of the, their function. But at the same time, if you want to do photothermal therapy, then you could just crank up the laser power. So you measure at low laser power and then crank up the laser power to actually kill, for example, cancer cells. Uh, just to show the photothermal effects, well, uh, you see here that uh, by uh, irradiating a tip that is coated with gold nanoparticles at five milliwatt, we can actually melt the tip, uh, which is not seen on an uncoated tip. So the photothermal plasmonic effect is actually quite significant on this tip. And this is one of the, the, um, the aspects I would like to do uh, while here in, uh, in Cambridge. Um, then let's sh shift uh, to uh, actual biochemical data. So we have been playing with uh, the uh, detection of metabolites in healthy and cancer cells. So, the, so cancer cells uh, are reputed to have a higher metabolic rate uh, than um, uh, healthy cells. So we have used the HeLa cells as a, mo a model cancer cell, and we have used UVEX cells as a normal healthy cells. And one of the things is that uh, if their um, metabolism is different, uh, 
Well, that means the chemical environment close to the cells should also be different because cells will consume molecules, which is the fuel of the cell. For example, glucose is one of them. It will also release molecules, essentially the waste product of glycolysis, which could be lactate. Since we have a sensor that is based, uh, that is mounted on the piezo stage, we can actually move the sensor and start far from the sensor and measure the bulk chemical composition uh, of, for example, the cell culture media, and then move closer and closer to the cells until we reach uh, essentially the, the, the cell surface. And thus we can measure chemical gradients within essentially less than tens of microns uh, from the cell. So we have uh, used the glycolysis pathway. So essentially uh, uh, in brief, glucose is uh, consumed by cells. So it goes in the cell, uh, it undergoes a series of enzyme reactions to lead to pyruvate and lactate. Lactate is a waste product of the cells. It's being excreted by the cell uh, to avoid contamination at the long term. Uh, on the other end, the nitrogen balance of the cell is so it's, it's driven by glutamine. So glutamine is, the, is a, um, a nitrogen source for the cell. It also is part of the TCA cycle here, and it will lead to um, essentially uh, the generation of ATP. And ATP and ADP can also be uh, actually from, uh, derived from uh, enzymes on the cell, uh, which are the energy source uh, of the cell, such that we could uh, calibrate for all of these molecules uh, moving closer to cells. So what we have done is that we have done those approach curves, so moving the sensor closer and closer to the surface. And what we see here is that uh, for glucose in black and gray and lactate in purple, if we measure the bulk response, so the bulk response is the shaded gray area, uh, it will give us for example, a, a number of, of counts or events, source events uh, per uh, time uh, unit. Uh, and as we move closer, we see that we have the same uh, bulk uh, response. And when we get really close to the cells, we see a drop in glucose because it's been uptaken by the cell. And we see a little rise of lactate in the case of the healthy cell. If we do the same thing close to the cancer cells, we see that drop is a little bit more significant and the rise of lactate is even more significant as well. And that's, that's indicative of the metabolism. Uh, we've done the experiment for all the molecules, and I will show them in different panels. We can do the same for the ATP and ADP balance uh, close to cells. And we see that both ATP and ADP are higher close to cells. Of course, these molecules are being used by the cells, so they should be at a higher concentration close to the cells. The same thing actually um, happens for glutamine and urea. So glutamine is a fuel, the nitrogen fuel of the cell. Urea is a waste product. We see that the glutamine drops close to cells for both UVEC and HeLa cells. And we do see a slight increase of urea close um, to the cells. So with that technique, now we can measure chemical gradients, um, or actually untargeted chemical gradients close to cells. We can also uh, impart chemical selectivity on the tip. So we can modify the tip uh, by uh, using a, a tile that is either selective for, for example, peroxide or for pH. Uh, so in this case, one of the things that we've done a little bit differently is that we've uh, absorbed the gold nanoparticles on the surface of the tip using the same polymer templating method as I've shown before. But we can also use in situ overgrowth of these particles to create either asymmetric shaped particles or larger particles that will be in closer uh, contact and thus improve the Raman signal uh, by doing so. So in this case, we could uh, essentially target uh, peroxide or pH sensing. And I'll show you the pH sensing that we have done close um, to cells. And as the tip is very small, we can also even uh, puncture the cell to measure pH gradients uh, between the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment. And we see here that, that we do see an heterogeneous response from uh, pH gradients close to a number of cells. So that can be used to, to monitor pH gradients uh, between healthy and cancer cell. And one of the um, uh, uh, rationale behind this is that since there is a higher metabolite uh, rate of cancer cell in principle, and oftentimes the pH uh, is lower near cancer cells. We can also uh, do a heavy metal detection. So in this case, we have modified the surface with a uh, mercaptopyridine. If you don't form a full monolayer on the surface of the gold nanoparticles, you'll be able to have a molecular reorientation upon binding of, of heavy metal ions. So in this case, we sense mercury, and mercury will bridge two mercaptopyridine uh, units 
uh, together and it will strengthen the molecule uh, on the surface. And that will change the ratio of some Raman bands that we see here in the shaded area. And if you plot the ratio of these bands, you can calibrate for mercury. And if you expose mercury to cancer cells, well, you can see that there's a, a mercury gradient inside the cell. So if you look essentially at a blank cell that has not been exposed to mercury, uh, we see a high intensity ratio, meaning that there's no mercury. And uh, as the mercury concentration has been increased, for, for example, to 680 nanomolar to 68 micromolar, we see that uh, there's more mercury inside the cell. And we see that there's more mercury inside the cytoplasm than inside the nucleus, such that uh, we can even see subcellular uh, re resolution of, of mercury gradients inside cells. So let me change uh, uh, topic or biochemical topic to talk now about the neurotransmitter monitor. So one of the current challenges in neurotransmitter or neurochemistry is that uh, the current techniques only offer the, the, the ability to measure four neurotransmitters. And, and also it's impossible to measure all four at the same time. So electrochemistry is the, is the dominant technique for neurochemistry, but, but electrochemistry does not have the molecular resolution, resolution capability to, to detect the different neurotransmitters. There is increasing evidence that um, neurochemistry is much more complex than serotonin and dopamine, such that we should detect a, a much broader range of molecules to be able to, to perform complex neurochemical measurements. So, um, being able to, um, to functionalize a tip with the gold nanoparticles and the gold nanoparticles being able to detect chemical uh, with high molecular selectivity, well, we've combined the two with uh, cultured neurons uh, in the petri dish plate, and we can perfuse these neurons to maintain them in a, uh, let's say, pseudo alive state. So um, uh, we can perfuse them with, uh, with oxygen and a, uh, a medium that is uh, conducive to maintain the neurons uh, uh, alive and thus see upon stimulation the release of neurotransmitters. So we have now recalibrated the, um, uh, our machine learning algorithm to be able to detect neurotransmitters. So in this case, we have dopamine glutamate, uh, ATP, uh, acetylcholine, GABA, uh, serotonin, ADP, and epinephrine. And we also calibrated for glucose. You can see that the, in the confusion matrix, glucose does have a lot of cross-reactivity because it's a, it has actually a very complex Raman spectra. But all of the neurotransmitters can be properly assigned uh, as, uh, the, the, um, uh, as dopamine, for example, for dopamine with uh, easily 90% uh, selectivity. So now we can perform uh, multiplex chemical measurements or neurochemical measurements close to these neurons. So in this case, uh, we saw um, uh, the co-release of glutamate and dopamine. Even though if these two molecules had been detected a number of times separately in the past, they've never been detected simultaneously in the same region uh, of neurons. So here we show that when we depolarize with high potassium, so that essentially uh, triggers a release uh, of, um, uh, of neurotransmitters uh, in neurons. And we see that we have a high count rate uh, for dopamine and glutamate. And when we go back to the basal condition, we see that the count rate is much fewer. So we see fewer counts and they're, uh, they're more sparse in time uh, doing so. So we can detect now neurotransmitters from, from different brain regions. Uh, so we can culture neurons from different part of the brain. And uh, it is already known that in the mesencephalon, uh, it will be mostly dominated by dopamine and glutamate. In the cerebral cortex is by glutamate and GABA, while as triton will mainly use GABA as uh, the neurochemical uh, for communication. So uh, each of these um, uh, neurons were cultured separately, and we were able to prove that the uh, machine learning algorithm and the SERS uh, optophysiology sensor were able to detect properly uh, uh, the neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters from different regions of the brain. So in the cortex, we should have seen uh, glutamate and GABA, and we see mostly glutamate in green and GABA in red. Uh, while for, this, for the mesencephalon, we should see mostly dopamine in blue and glutamate in green, which we see. And the same thing happens for the striatum. We see mostly GABA. We do see a little bit of dopamine, which is not unexpected. Uh, but uh, here, the, 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 the uh, percentage increase in count is a little bit skewed by the very, very low number of counts from dopamine uh, in those conditions. But uh, we are now uh, performing uh, correlated measurements with mass spectrometry just to confirm uh, all of these proper identification of these molecules. But we do have now a tool uh, to, to measure complex neurochemical gradients uh, close to cells and neurons. 
Well, cultured cell and neurons are interesting in some aspects, but they do not provide the complex neurochemistry because neurons communicate between each other. And thus, uh, it would be much more uh, uh, clinically valid, uh, valid to perform these measurements inside uh, brain tissues. So now we, we use the, the same tips uh, and we insert them in brain tissue. So we, we take uh, uh, brains from mice that we slice to about 300 microns thickness. The first 50 microns is dead tissue. So the, so the slicing process will kill uh, the, the first few layers of cells and neurons. Uh, but there's about 200 microns of uh, live tissue that is maintained uh, in perfusion uh, in living conditions for a period of time of a few hours. So now we need to, to detect um, the neurochemical signals from inside the brain tissue. Unfortunately, brain tissues are highly scattering. So here we have the scattering cross-section uh, at different wavelengths of different tissues. And we see that brain is the, higher scat the highest scatterer. Uh, comparatively, the skull is about four to five times less scattering than the brain, which is actually quite surprising skull being bone. Uh, but the brain is even more scattering than bone. Uh, if you compare that to muscle, muscle will be uh, essentially about 10 times less scattering than the brain tissue. So essentially what happens is that as soon as you insert the, the fiber in, inside the brain tissue, the Raman signal that was quite high in, uh, in the bulk solution drops to essentially about 10% of the uh, intensity within about the first 100 microns. So we, we barely are in the, the sweet spot region, so below 50 microns, and but we lose about 90% of our signal. Um, signal loss is one thing, but also how do we insert uh, the, uh, the, the, this fiber inside brain tissues? If we just go down like this with the piezo stage, well, we will slice the brain tissue. I, I think you will agree that slicing a brain will not be uh, actually conducive to maintaining the brain alive. It will slice neurons and thus will be uh, quite, uh, uh, quite detrimental to the, the health status of the neurons. So um, we have modified our piezo stage here. So we, we don't use a piezo stage anymore. We have created a, a micro manipulator, which works on a uh, angle ac a linear uh, axis. So in this case, when we insert the, the, the fiber in the brain tissue, we will extend that arm inside the brain tissue. So it will pierce the brain, which is the typical way of doing uh, electrophysiology or physical, phys physiological measurements inside uh, tissues. So uh, by, by the piercing action, you essentially push aside the, the, the cells instead of rupturing them uh, properly said. So now we can do that, but how do you find the, now the, 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 the ROM uh, probe? Because when you lower the, the, the probe, you can focus the probe uh, at the uh, distance from the, from the tissue. And then you, when you insert it, you should, see, you should still be essentially at the focal point or close to the focal point because it didn't change the, uh, the optics uh, of, the, um, of the fiber. But when you come at it with an angle at a piercing action, that means you, don't, uh, you cannot focus until you're set inside the tissue. But then the tissue is so scattering that uh, you don't really see well the, uh, the fiber once it, once it is uh, inside the brain tissue. And you see some kind of a fuzzy uh, shade uh, of, the, uh, of the fiber. So now we're trying to develop uh, the functional materials uh, where it will have a Raman signal embedded inside the material to be able to guide the, the, the Raman laser to the proper location. Uh, we want to functionalize the, uh, the here in a core molecule shell fashion because we need to keep the shell uh, exempt of Raman response because we still want the molecules and neurotransmitters to bind on that shell and be able to yield a large Raman signal. So we, we, we put a molecular shell uh, inside um, this, uh, this second uh, metallic shell that would provide an embedded Raman signal. And then we can use different type of, of Raman molecules to provide different Raman uh, signal. And we favor uh, the use of that triple bond uh, uh, molecule uh, or triple bond molecule because it has a Raman signature in the otherwise Raman uh, silent region of 2100 uh, wave numbers. We show here that we can create those um, uh, structures and still be able to detect molecules on the outside. So the mercaptobenzonitrile here is, in, is the molecular shell. 
cell, while rudiment 6G was in solution, and we see the peaks from rudiment 6G that are in, in, well intercalated by the peaks of mercaptobenzonitrile. Mercaptobenzonitrile does have a number of peaks in the Raman sensitive region where neurotransmitters are uh, detected. So we would like to avoid that because you see that here the mercaptobenzonitrile is dominant, even compared to rudiment 6G, which is actually a very good Raman dye. So one of the approaches that we are trying at the moment is to use uh, cyanide. So we can uh, bind a layer of cyanide on the gold surface and then create a, another shell. And you see here that uh, we do see at the, the typical peak of cyanide at 2100 uh, wave numbers, but we do see the, also the rhodamine 6G peaks on the outside. And now the cyanide peak is not dominant and the ones from the outside are a little bit more intense. So now we have a way to um, probe inside a tissue, but uh, you would agree that using 633 nanometer laser will not be optimal because of the scattering. So if we go to longer wavelengths, uh, the scattering of brain tissue actually decreases exponentially. And if we go, for example, to wavelength range of uh, close to a one uh, micron and above, uh, we still have a, uh, an optically clear window where water does not absorb much. So here is the, um, is the absorbance spectra of water. So there's, there are some minor peaks at 900 and 1200, uh, and there's a major peak here at 1.4 micron. So we can use that, that optically clear window here uh, to be able to, to uh, increase uh, the penetration of the light inside the brain tissue and uh, be able to collect more light uh, from brain tissue. So um, now we are building a new microscope uh, that will be able to perform short wavelength IR uh, SERS spectroscopy. So uh, in, this, in this case, we will have two different lasers at, at one point, well, at 1064 nanometers at 1.3 microns. Uh, we will just use a, here a beam splitter to be able to uh, uh, combine the two lasers uh, as needed uh, into the optical path. And we are uh, currently uh, uh, purchasing a um, uh, in-gas camera to be able to, um, to perform Raman measurements uh, at those wavelengths. Being at that much longer wavelengths means that we need to change the materials. And this is another reason why uh, I'm here uh, this summer uh, is to uh, gain on the expertise here uh, on nanomaterials uh, that are non-classical plasmonic materials. Uh, as uh, there's three ways to uh, be able to match the, the nanomaterials with the uh, near IR to short wavelength uh, IR uh, range is that we can either change the size of the material, but that has only a limited uh, ability because the, the change in wavelength is actually rather small with a change in, in, in size or diameter. We can change the shape, and the shape of rods are actually quite interesting because the longer the rods, the closer to near infrared they will be, and you can reach easily uh, one micron to 1.3 micron with long uh, gold rods. But you can also change the material, uh, the nature of the material by itself, and you can change to a non-classical uh, uh, plasmonic material. So the classical ones are essentially gold and, and silver. Uh, but here there's an expertise uh, that I wanted to, to leverage to be able to design materials that will be uh, SERS active uh, in the near infrared to uh, short wavelength IR infrared range. Uh, why is it important to, to do that? Is because we want to combine that with also with optogenetics. Uh, so without going into too much details about optogenetics, so optogenetics is a uh, uh, physiology uh, technique uh, that uh, uses a light activated channel on the membrane of, of neurons. And when you irradiate the neurons with blue light, it will open up a channel, it, cations will move in the cell, uh, it will depolarize the cell and will lead to a trigger uh, that will be uh, formed. And that trigger will actually lead to the secretion of neurotransmitters. So this is actually quite interesting because most physiological measurements in the brain now uses that type of optogenetics uh, measurements. Actually, optogenetics even reaches quite far. Uh, so some of my colleagues in Montreal are using optogenetics to, uh, to simulate uh, plant growth uh, by using light activated channels uh, that could change actually how agricultural yields uh, are at the moment. So we can now uh, combine optogenetics with the uh, SERS optophysiology approach. And so we have further modified our Raman system where we have here a blue LED that is fiber optically coupled into the backside uh, here, which is essentially the, um, the backside here is, is the inverted microscope uh, of our confocal microscope. And so we can feed blue light inside here on the bottom side of the Petri dish. We can still come at an angle uh, with our fiber, uh, nanofiber inside the, the brain tissue. And we can collect the Raman signal from the top. 
since blue light can be filtered uh, massively by the Raman filters, it does not interfere with uh, the detection uh, of the Raman signal. So in this case here, that means we can trigger uh, by sending pulses of blue light, the secretion of neurotransmitters. And here we show the very first in tissue SERS measurements of the release uh, using optogenetics uh, of, of, of neurotransmitters. So we, we are here in the basal conditions and we do see some very, very small Raman spectra uh, from uh, what is most likely dopamine. And you have here just a, one uh, snapshot of that. When the blue light would be uh, irradiated, we will see a little bit of blue light seeking, uh, or seeping inside the camera. So the, the background will raise a little bit. The blue light will be flashed for about two seconds right now. And uh, we'll see at the, the end, a massive trigger, a massive release of uh, probably what is dopamine. And we see here the static um, or the, the snapshot uh, Raman signal from that uh, dopamine release. So now it provides us a way to monitor uh, the secretion of, of metabolites, uh, well, complex neurochemicals uh, in a triggered manner. So by sending the blue light pulse, we can see uh, the, uh, the uh, essentially the, the release of the neurotransmitters. And this is looping back and you'll see again uh, the, uh, the release of neurotransmitters uh, quite shortly. So uh, this provides a way to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, trigger uh, the neurochemistry that we want to probe. So um, this is uh, where we are at the moment. Uh, so we see that uh, that source of physiology could be a next generation molecular analysis uh, tool to survey complex chemical changes in the local vicinity of cells, neurons, and tissues. Uh, we can detect a, a broad variety of molecules. So we still have ways to go. Uh, so the sensor design is, is, is far advanced, but it's not perfect. Uh, we do have data processing methods that we're trying to further refine. So we, we are trying to, to um, provide, for example, quantitative measurements using machine learning. Uh, we do have other microscope prototypes that are being constructed, but some of them are currently functional. Um, and uh, But the, the, I think the bottom line is that um, uh, while these proof of concept experiments are promising, it's not limited to these uh, proof of concept experiments because it could be applicable to different cell or tissue models. And we, we see that as being a, a, a more broadly applicable tool uh, in the future. Finally, I need to, to thank uh, the people that are in the lab. Uh, unfortunately, that picture is no longer representative of the group because it was taken the last time we could uh, convene, which was a, a more than a year and a half ago. Uh, so the picture is now two years old and I, I would say about three quarter of the team have moved on to, uh, to different um, uh, projects and venues. But I need to thank the current team and the former team that actually helped uh, starting that project. I need to also thank uh, the funding agencies in Canada that supports us um, uh, for this work. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have.